So, um, as Alan says, uh, I currently hold a Wellcome Trust Senior Investigator Award to study the recent developments in genetic and genomic medicine. Uh, and this, this piece of work that I'll be talking about today comes out of that project, looking at biotechnology and especially Kenneth Murray's uh, work in Edinburgh to develop a recombinant vaccine against hepatitis B. I should say this is very much a joint piece of work. Uh, the, most of the research for this, in fact, was done by my research fellow Farah Huzair, whose name is up there. She really is the person who should be presenting this afternoon because she's the one who did most of the work on this, who really knows the stuff, who got her hands dirty in the archives and who has interviewed a number of people for this. Um, she is currently, this very afternoon, being interviewed for a lectureship at the University of Edinburgh, so uh, she has uh, very good reason not to be here. Um, she sends her apologies, but it does mean that you're getting uh, the monkey, not the organ grinder this afternoon, so uh, apologies for that, but I will try and uh, cover for what uh, Farah would have said. The story I really want to focus on is the development of this vaccine, Engerix B, uh, which was approved for marketing in Europe in December 1986. Uh, it took a while to get then approved in the United States and was developed very much here in Edinburgh by a team that was led by Kenneth Murray, later Sir Kenneth Murray, a nice photo of him up here. You may see written uh, in obituaries of Kenneth Murray that this was the first ever recombinant vaccine. In fact, it was just pipped to market by a very similar vaccine produced by Merck, which came out, was uh, approved for marketing in May 1986. But in many ways, to talk about priority is really quite invidious. The Merck vaccine uh, used uh, li licensed um, patents that Kenneth Murray had, uh, had filed, and vice versa, the uh, patents that were filed by the uh, team in University of California, San Francisco, uh, for the Merck vaccine were similarly licensed for Engerix B. So in many ways, talking about who was the first to market, who developed the first uh, vaccine is, uh, is really missing the point. Kenneth Murray was hugely involved right from the start and uh, did groundbreaking work that led to the development of this vaccine. A quick little bit about Murray's background. He's quite a remarkable man and quite a, a remarkable story. He was born in um, Yorkshire, as Alan said, but uh, moved when he was quite young to Nottinghamshire. His father was a miner who was injured in a, a mining accident and became a school caretaker. So very much a working class family, not a wealthy family. And Kenneth uh, simply didn't have the expectations that he would have the wherewithal to go to university. He was very good at sciences at school. And he got a job, first of all, as a lab assistant at what was then Boots the Chemist, uh, and then moved on to Glaxo, working in the uh, pharmaceutical laboratories there. His talent was evident, and Glaxo supported him to do a part-time Bachelor of Science in Chemistry at the University of Birmingham, which he graduated from with first-class honours, uh, and he then managed to get a grant-funded place to do a PhD, also in chemistry, looking at the chemistry of uh, chromatin, and specifically at the histones, one of the proteins that's involved in the, uh, the structure of the chromosomes. And he completed that in 1959. Along the way, he met the scientist who became his wife, uh, Noreen Parker, a very uh, herself a very accomplished uh, molecular biologist, molecular geneticist. She won't figure much in this story, but she was clearly a very important factor in uh, the development of Kenneth's career and in the work that he, uh, he did here at Edinburgh. The two of them were able to get postdoctoral positions, first of all at Stanford, where Murray continued to work on his stones, and then at Cambridge, where he was working in the laboratory of Fred Sanger at the Molecular Biology Laboratory. Uh, still working, though, on histones, not yet on DNA, although he was quite interested in Sanger's work to develop DNA sequencing, some of the first sequencing techniques. He didn't really make the move over to uh, working on DNA and the genome until he got his position here in Edinburgh as a senior lecturer in molecular biology at 1967, in 1967. 
Noreen by that time was getting very interested in the use of restriction enzymes, uh, both their biology, their biological function, but the way that they could be used to cut up DNA and could be used in early uh, molecular biological techniques. And at that point, it was really in the early 1970s that Ken became interested in developing uh, early techniques around the use of uh, the recombinant DNA, cutting up DNA and finding ways of introducing it into other organisms for, um, to see how it was expressed in, in, in other organisms. So uh, recombinant DNA research that, that um, Kenneth started to get involved in. And this became a hugely important uh, technique with the work of Stanley Cohen and Herbert Boyer in California uh, at uh, Boyer at uh, University of California, San Francisco, Cohen at Stanford, and uh, the work that they did to develop recombinant DNA techniques to show that it was possible to introduce genes from one organism into another, working mainly with microorganisms at this time, and to express the proteins by those inserted genes in uh, bacterial cultures. And they patented this in 1974. And that patent, uh, applied for in 1974, approved in 1980, became the basis of biotechnology based on recombinant DNA techniques. It was very quickly publicized as a potential industrial application of molecular biology. And at that time, uh, there was a lot of venture capital being promoted in the United States and the first startup biotechnology company, Genentech, was founded in 1976 by a venture capitalist, Robert Swanson and Herbert Boyer, to use this new technique to produce medical proteins. And they were looking particularly in the first instance at insulin and then at things like um, uh, human growth hormone and at uh, interferon. Two other venture capitalists who invested early in Genentech were Ray Schaefer and Daniel Adams, and they decided that they wanted to start a company of their own. And they recruited another very prominent uh, molecular biologist, Walter Gilbert from Harvard, to recruit further molecular biologists to found a company. And they decided, Genentech was based in the United States, they decided that they would look to Europe and forget the best of the talent that was available in Europe to found their company. Among those invited to a meeting in Geneva in early 1978 was Kenneth Murray, who was known within the discipline for his emerging work on uh, recombinant DNA. And the company Biogen was set up, incorporated in 1978, incorporated initially in Luxembourg. And We've got a picture here of the uh, meeting in which the uh, agreement was signed that they would set up this company. Murray is the man in the middle down here. We've also got uh, people who figure briefly in the story. Well, first of all, uh, Charlotte and, and sorry, Adams and Schaefer, the two uh, venture capitalists who put, in, put up the money. Behind them, Charles Weissman uh, and... Walter Gil Gilbert, the Harvard, uh, quite a, a swash swashbuckling character. He was a, a serial founder of companies. Um, not necessarily the greatest businessman, uh, but very successful as the, uh, the, the person who gave the impetus to the founding of the companies and who uh, was very important in the Biogen story. The program for Biogen was agreed at a series of meetings where basically the various biologists who were involved in this and the molecular biologists who made up the company were told to bring along a project that they were interested in that they thought would be, have the possibility, the potential to lead to commercializable products. Most of the suggestions that were put forward were ones that were already of interest to, for instance, Genentech or to others who were thinking about moving into uh, biotechnology. So insulin was 
uh, an obvious one to go for. Everybody about, knew about insulin, and uh, there was quite a race on for that. The big one, the one that was really seen as the big money spinner, potential big money spinner, was interferon, which was seen at that time as a potential cancer treatment. But Murray and another person who doesn't, for some reason, isn't in that picture, Peter Hans Hofschneider, another molecular biologist uh, from Germany, proposed to develop a vaccine against hepatitis B. Now, it's interesting that they chose a vaccine. It's interesting that they chose hepatitis B. Vaccines were not seen as particularly interesting commercial property at that time for a variety of reasons. Most pharmaceutical companies had actually got out of vaccine production. They were not profitable. There were a lot of risks associated with them. There'd been a number of scandals about contaminated vaccines. And there was, at that time, seemed to be really quite a, a crisis of vaccine production. So the idea that money could be made out of vaccines was not particularly uh, prominent at that time. It appears that Hofschneider's and Murray's reasons for wanting to go for a vaccine were to do with other factors than simply the idea that they could make money. Hofschneider, we know, was interested in the biology of hepatitis B and particularly the idea that was coming to light at that time that uh, hepatitis B might be a significant cause of liver cancer. But Murray was interested in hepatitis B for quite specifically Edinburgh reasons. Hepatitis B isn't a particularly common disease in the Western world. It's very common in developing countries, but it uh, was not seen as a major health problem or public health problem uh, in the United States, in Britain. But it was, there were places where it was problematic, and that was particularly in medical settings. It's transmitted by contaminated blood, and it was known to be a problem of the emerging technology of artificial dialysis. And in 1969, there was a very significant, one of the major uh, outbreaks of hepatitis B here at the Western General Infirmary in the dialysis unit, which over the three years that it, uh, uh, it continued uh, led to the death of seven patients and four staff. Around that, Edinburgh also became a centre of expertise in the biology of hepatitis B as a consequence of that outbreak. The uh, professor of bi uh, bacteriology, Barry Marmion, was very uh, involved in the efforts to bring the, uh, the outbreak under control and uh, very involved also in policy initiatives to ensure that it didn't happen again, to look at issues of control more widely. And he deliberately not only skilled himself in the, the science of, of uh, hepatitis B, but brought in a, bacteria, a, a virologist, I beg your pardon, Chris Burrell, to establish hepatitis B research here in Edinburgh and to oversee the establishment of a diagnostic labor, a library, a, a, a library of serotypes for use in uh, diagnosing and tracking uh, any future outbreaks. Burrell was a very accomplished uh, virologist himself, uh, and among other things, he was one of the uh, few people in the UK uh, and indeed in the world to be able to isolate DNA from hepatitis B uh, in the 1970s in the course of his research into the, uh, the virus. And we know that Marmion introduced Murray to Burrell in 1977. Nothing came out of it at that point, but clearly Murray was interested in hepatitis B before even becoming involved in Biogen. And this was part of the background to uh, the decision to pursue a vaccine. The fact that clearly the effects of the disease were known, they, uh, the repercussions were known here in Edinburgh, and there was expertise here in Edinburgh to be able to work with the virus and with its DNA. So once they decided to pursue a vaccine, they moved very quickly indeed. There were a number of stages to this first part of the story of developing the vaccine. The first steps involved extracting viral DNA, which was undertaken by 
Burrell and by a colleague in uh, bacteriology, Patricia McKay. Between them, they extracted viral DNA, and then once they had the, the, the DNA extracted, they cut it up into uh, shorter lengths using restriction enzymes. So they had a whole sort of sequence of chunks of the viral DNA available to them. To then proceed to do, if you like, molecular biological and especially uh, biotechnological work with that, they had to find ways of reproducing that DNA. So the next step involved putting the uh, lengths of DNA into plasmids, uh, short lengths of bacterial DNA which could be moved from one bacterium to another, that they move between bacteria. Murray and Hofschneider didn't have the particular skills for that, so they went to the laboratory of Charles Weissman, another of the biogen scientists in Zurich, where the necessary reagents and the necessary skills uh, were available. So in uh, Weissmann's lab, they inserted the DNA into plasmids. So they now had these um, lengths of DNA in bacterial DNA. But they weren't yet in bacteria. To insert the DNA into bacteria for culturing, they needed to uh, have access, to, first of all, to the bacteria themselves, but also, crucially, to appropriate laboratory facilities. This was a time when uh, recombinant DNA research was still very new. There was an awful lot of anxiety about it, about the potential risks that might be associated with creating recombinant organisms. For a while, there had been a self-imposed uh, self moratorium by molecular biologists on the creation of recombinant organisms, which, following a series of conferences, gave rise to quite strict guidelines about the circumstances under which this work could be done. And here in the UK, uh, the, the, these were overseen by the Health and Safety Executive. It was required that work to create new recombinant organisms should be done in uh, high security, biosecurity, uh, and biosafety uh, settings. And Murray and Hofschneider were able to find a laboratory for this purpose at the Ministry of Defense's uh, germ warfare laboratories in Portland Down, which at that time was also trying to branch out into um, public health work. So they were able to do the creation of the uh, uh, recombinant E. coli uh, cultures down in Portland Down. Once they had those, they were then able at last to come back to Edinburgh to uh, start to culture up the, uh, the E. coli with the lengths of DNA in them and to see if any of those cultures were ones with the different lengths of DNA in them were actually expressing proteins, producing proteins that would produce, uh, that were capable of producing uh, an, an immune response and whether in, they were antigenic. So they, um, Heather Davidson and Sandra Bruce, working in a, uh, a, a lab that was created, especially a bio biosafety lab here in Edinburgh, started to culture up uh, those cells, see what proteins they were producing, and then see if, using immun immunoassay, see if they were reacting with uh, antisera. There's a nice quote that Farah uh, got from a, a, an interview with Sandra Bruce, which says just a little bit about the circumstances they were working in. She said, they had to build a special lab for us up at King's Buildings that was essentially a cupboard. They reckoned we couldn't work in a normal lab. We had to have barriers. This is the biosafety requirements. So they made up this sort of what you'd probably call Category 3, a level of biosafety, but it was very much a sort of homemade one. It had double doors. Anything that went in couldn't come out till it was sterilized, and you had to double gown and stuff like that. It was very small, anyway. It was a bench and a couple of bits of kit. It was horrible. And in the summer, it was really horrible, because the Darwin building, you either boiled in the summer or you froze in the winter, and you were running autoclaves to sterilize stuff before you could get rid of it. So working under less than ideal circumstances, but they were able to demonstrate, nonetheless, that some of these bacterial cultures were indeed producing polypeptides, chains of uh, um, sections of proteins that would produce, that were acting as antigens from the uh, hepatitis B. 
So they were able to show that there was potentially at least a vaccine available from these. At the same time, Murray, working now in particular with another of the uh, biogen scientists, Heinz Schaller from uh, uh, Heidelberg, went over to uh, Walter Gilbert's laboratory in Harvard. Gilbert was one of the real experts in DNA sequencing. Shallow was no mean hand at DNA sequencing himself. And between them, they were able to sequence 87% of the hepatitis B virus. So a very substantial proportion of the uh, genome of this virus was um, sequenced at this point. Really quite a remarkable achievement and a very significant, quite a landmark achievement uh, in terms of developing an understanding of the, uh, the, the structure of, the, uh, of a, a, a virus. Um, this was work that was done in just, oh, well, 14 months, a little over a year. This was absolutely groundbreaking scientific work. It led to two publications in the top journal Nature. The first one uh, documenting the, uh, the achievement of the uh, cloning and then expression of um, antigenic polypeptides from the virus. And then the second one detailing the structure of the genome uh, and uh, the, the um, sequence of the, of the genome. Quite remarkable achievements within, as I say, a very short time. In addition, uh, just uh, Four months later, they were able to... So the, the uh, December 1979 paper was actually submitted in the August. Also in December, they um, filed a patent application for a vaccine. It's a very general title, but it's quite specifically for uh, the production of a vaccine, a method of producing a vaccine, using recombinant DNA from the hepatitis B virus. So a remarkable year's work, 14, 16 months' work, absolutely astonishing. That was the easy bit. What they then had to do was to move on. I mean, they were working very much as, if you like, molecular biologists, working within their comfort zone, working within the lab, working with microorganisms, demonstrating simply that they were able to achieve expression of particular proteins uh, under laboratory circumstances. If they wanted to produce a vaccine, they then had to go through all the additional business of scaling up, of demonstrating that the uh, products that they were, were being, being produced uh, were actually uh, capable not just of producing, uh, uh, you know, were not just antigenic under laboratory circumstances, but would actually uh, protect against infection and then getting these manufactured, getting this substance manufactured at uh, a sufficient uh, economic scale. And that took an awful lot longer. That would take another five to six years, in fact, to get this done. And again, it involved a lot of work with uh, different people and in different settings. The first work that was done took nearly three years. Uh, was involved primarily experimenting with different lengths of viral DNA, different uh, what were called DNA constructs, so that the, the, it wasn't just the viral DNA that would be inserted into uh, the host cells, but also various other bits of uh, genetic machinery, promoters, and so on. That were, the, the issue was how you could uh, make these bacterial cultures sufficiently productive of the particular proteins or polypeptides that you wanted for them then to be potentially scalable up to industrial levels. So there was an awful lot of trial and error going on with different kinds, different bits of the, of the viral genome, different uh, antigens that they wanted to produce to see how immu immunogenic they were. And then testing these also uh, to see if they actually produce an immune response, not now just in a test tube, but in rabbits. And uh, Patricia Mackay, Mackay, in particular, was able to uh, get access to uh, the Morden Institute, another Edinburgh Institute, 
uh, uh, primarily involved with animal breeding and agricultural research, where they were able to uh, test the, um, the potential antigens in rabbits to see if they actually produced an immune response. I'll also, I mean, another thing that did come out of this at the time, uh, I don't really have time to go into it, but they, they also produced, uh, very importantly, a diagnostic test based on one of the antigens that they were able to produce that itself became really quite an important uh, commercial development and public health development and was uh, a major money earner for Biogen. It's not particularly remembered in the stories uh, that are told, but it's well worth, I think, flagging up, and I could say a little more about that if you if you wish later. But, so this was the sort of trial and error work, trying to see if they could produce bacterial cultures that had industrial potential. One really serious problem that they ran into at this time was that the protein molecules and the polypeptides they were producing, while they certainly had some degree of immunogenic uh, power, were not producing enough of an immune response to, to look as though they were going to be potential vaccines. They were only producing a weak immune response in the rabbits that were being used. This was a problem that wasn't just encountered by uh, Murray's team, but the, the other teams who were now starting to work on this. So the team at UCSF uh, were also finding that they were trying to produce um, the antigens in E. coli, they weren't producing a satisfactory immune response. Likewise, the team at the Pasteur Institute were having similar problems. And it looked as though the problem was that the proteins that were being produced, produced in order to act, have a, a sufficient, sufficient immunogenic power, needed to be folded in the right way. It wasn't just the protein, the chemical structure, the folding of that protein was important. And Produced in a bacterium, in E. coli, it wasn't folded in the right way. So they wondered if this could be overcome by producing the vaccine in eukaryotic cells. Murray, as the other teams, for a while experimented with mammalian cells, including um, uh, uh, liver cancer cells which uh, were known to express, uh, to be quite expressive of, of um, hepatitis anti antigens in many cases. Uh, and in fact, the Pasteur Institute team ended up producing their vaccine using uh, Chinese hamster ovary cells, a, cell, a standard cell culture of that time. Murray, though, uh, and his team actually picked up on work that was done in the University of California, where it was shown that the production of the antigens, not in E. coli, but in yeast cells, also produced immunogenic forms of the antigen. And this was, uh, a, a, the UCSF team patented their use of uh, yeast cells uh, for this purpose. So this was a, a patent that Murray had to license from, uh, from UCSF for uh, for his, uh, his vaccine when it finally came out. But Murray then picked up anyway on um, the, the fact that you could use yeast and working now with Albert Hinnon, who was one of the pioneers of, uh, of yeast molecular biology, not in fact a Biogen member, but a, a, a European contact, uh, they were able to move on to producing recombinant yeast strains, which they showed were able to produce sufficient levels of um, immunogenic uh, proteins to potentially act as a vaccine. And they then moved on to actually undertake uh, tests, not just in rabbits, but tests in primates to show that this potential vaccine did, in fact, protect against hepatitis B infection. For this purpose, they had to go to yet another collaborator. Hepatitis B only infects a very small range of species, just higher primates. So they had to go to a research facility that, uh, where they would have access to higher primates. In this case, they went to the Netherlands, where Hoop Schellekens, 
uh, was working with chimpanzees, and they conducted a series of experiments with chimpanzees to show that the vaccine protected against infection with hepatitis B. So, by later in 1983, they had a means of producing the vaccine. They had a way, uh, they had shown that that vaccine protected against hepatitis B. What they now needed was a manufacturer. And this was the next big problem. As I've said, companies, pharmaceutical companies, had pulled out since the 1960s, systematically pulled out of vaccines, which were not seen as a particularly good uh, business proposition. It was seen as a major problem, and there were a number of committees, for instance, in the United States and in the UK, uh, to actually address the, uh, to see what could be done to stimulate the pharmaceutical industry to uh, address this problem, this problem in uh, crisis in vaccine uh, manufacture and vaccine in innovation. Only a few companies had remained in that area. One was Merck, uh, who were working with the UCSF team. Another was the Pasteur Institute and the, the um, commercial wing of the Pasteur Institute in France. Murray didn't have any such connections, and he had to start looking around for people to work with. He was able to um, initially get a very promising contact with Welcome Biotechnology, a, a company within the, fam the Welcome family of companies that was interested in, was developing the new biotechnologies, was interested in the vaccine, not so much as a commercial proposition, but really as a way of building up its, um, it, it, its commercial capacity and its, its, its capacity in biotechnology. A number of other companies did that. So Merck, when they decided to pursue uh, a, a recombinant vaccine uh, against hepatitis B, it was quite explicitly a way of keeping abreast of the new science and the new technology, not because of any particular commercial promise, but because they wanted to build their capacity in this area in case the technology took off. Welcome seemed to be working in very much the same way. They also saw the vaccine as... Uh, and this is a, a note from uh, a, a meeting that Murray attended, an entry ticket to newer markets, for instance, the United States. So they saw it really as, in many ways as a loss leader, a way that they would be able to get into the United States potentially. The work with um, Welcome initially proceeded very well. They began uh, the first uh, clinical studies of the vaccine in February 1984, moved up to full-scale clinical trials by June 1985, and by the autumn of 1986, it was clear from those clinical trials that the vaccine was effective, that they were able to produce, uh, to, to attain um, commercial levels of production, and that this was something that could potentially be uh, brought, at, brought to market. And at that point... Welcome pulled out. The reason being that the Welcome Foundation, the charitable organization that owned the Welcome drug companies, decided that they were going to sell off large parts of their shares to enhance their uh, ability to fund charitable research. So they wanted to liquidize uh, much of their, many of their assets. For that purpose, they wanted to make sure that they were uh, seen to be as lean and mean as possible, the companies that they were selling off, they wanted them to be seen to be you know, very profitable, and the hepatitis B vaccine simply wasn't a sufficiently good commercial proposition to be worth pursuing. So they got it almost to market and then pulled out. And in the end, the vaccine was picked up by SmithKline Biologicals, a company based in Belgium, um, who were able to complete the marketing approval process and brought the vaccine and Jerix B to market in December 1986. For various reasons, I don't, again, I don't have time to go into them, it turned out that the vaccine was commercially very successful. It's a, an ironic story that, in fact, this was a vaccine that transformed the vaccine production system and really revitalized uh, the commercial prospects of vaccines uh, 
in the developed world especially, but that happened after the, uh, the vaccine came to market. I'm really un only interested in, the, in this talk in how it got there. But there's just a couple of things I want to conclude by saying. I mean, I think this is a really interesting story. First of all, because it is very much an Edinburgh story. There are real reasons why this happened here in Edinburgh, and I hope I've managed to outline some of those. It's a lot to do with um, Kenneth Murray himself. It's a lot to do with the particular circumstances of uh, the way hepatitis B research more generally developed here. So it's very much an Edinburgh story. But it's also, as again, I think I've, hopefully the story uh, has, has brought out, an international story. The work wasn't just done here in Edinburgh. In fact, it was done through a whole network of collaborations. The bits of DNA were traveling around the world, back and forth, back and forth, uh, to, uh, to, to bring this uh, science and then the technology to fruition. So it's a story of Edinburgh really interacting with scientists and then with, um, uh, with, with companies around the world. One strand of that is that it was very much about uh, the, the, the circumstances under which it was done, particularly the financing and the way that the work was organized, was very much about pioneering a new model of commercially oriented biotechnological work. And this was very much an American model. It was imported from America by American venture capitalists, headed up by an American scientist, modeled on a new kind of American company, which Genentech was really the, uh, the, you know, the, the first model for this. It was funded by venture capital. It was undertaken for both sim simultaneously scientific reasons. Um, there's a very good book by Nicholas Rasmussen called Gene Jockeys, which looks at the American side of this story. It's very clear that all of the early biotechnologists were very keen to get world-leading world scientific research out of this. Murray's uh, nature papers exemplify that, but also the very quick move to patent and to make sure that this would be commercializable was very important, and that is also something that really was imported from the American side of the um, biotechnological story. Murray's patenting... Well, first of all, the, the work that was being done didn't attract an awful lot of attention here in Edinburgh. It was seen as something that was sort of an add-on to the work of the uh, molecular biology department. There wasn't much interest, apart from those who were directly involved in the work, in what was going on uh, in this project. And I think um, Sandra Bruce's story of the way they were sort of given a little cupboard to turn into a biosafety lab I think is, is quite indicative of the lack of interest that there was uh, in this as science um, in this setting. And also the move to patenting. Uh, another very prominent molecular biologist who was in Edinburgh at that time, and himself went on to become uh, quite a, a key figure, Ed Southern, said in a, an interview, not one that we conducted, that when Murray patented his work, this was seen by most of the scientists in his department as a sellout. There was a lot of suspicion about how close he was getting to commercial aims and commercial interests. What was important, though, and Southern in the interview goes on to say this, is the way that Murray then dealt with this. Murray made an awful lot of money, particularly after, the, after Biogen went public in 1983, and then when the, first of all, the diagnostic and then the, um, the vaccine were commercial successes, he made a lot of money out of it. And he put that money into further research, primarily through uh, a charitable trust. He's founded the Darwin Trust, uh, which uh, has poured, uh, you know, supported, first of all, a lot of uh, infrastructure down at King's Buildings here in Edinburgh, but also funded an awful lot of scientific research and scientific training, particularly for junior scholars. And the fact that Murray didn't take the money for himself but poured it back into further scientific research was seen as a major uh, way of, uh, of making 
this kind of commercial enterprise acceptable to scientists here in Edinburgh and more generally in the UK. Um, Ed Southern went to Oxford, uh, became a, a leader in uh, microarray technology, um, founded a company in the 1990s and himself created a charitable trust on the same model as the Darwin Trust. So in a, in a sense, Murray, I think, needs to be seen, first of all, you know, on, on the one hand, as somebody who brought this commercial approach to biotechnology into the UK, but also who made it acceptable through the way that he used that money for charitable purposes and particularly for further developing the science. That, I think, is well, I'll leave it for now, but thank you very much for listening. I'll be very happy to take any questions.